I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Oscar Arnulfo Romero, presente. 39 years ago today, Oscar Arnulfo Romero was assassinated in San Salvador, in El Salvador, in the midst of celebrating the Mass. Supposedly, he was in the midst of raising the Holy Sacrament, and a gunman who had come into the back of the church fired a single shot, which killed him as he was in the midst of celebrating the Eucharist. This was in some of the worst days of the Civil War in El Salvador, some of the worst days of any of the civil wars in Central America or in South America. Today, Oscar Romero is a saint. He's one of the few 20th century saints. And so we have here on the small movable altar an icon of San Romero of the Americas, San Romero de las Americas. He's a symbol of the gospel. He's a symbol of resistance to all that would be counter to the gospel. A symbol of life, a symbol of ministry, a symbol of dedication and of faithfulness. Like all people and things that become symbols, he also has become subject to human interpretation. Now, at the time during his ministry, there was a theology and a practice that became incredibly popular because in its practice, it was exceedingly powerful and meaningful, especially to disempowered people on the fringes of society or in rural areas that were far away from any power. And that was called liberation theology. It's credited with having really begun in Brazil, and yet it spread far and wide all throughout South America and Central America. It was a way of living the Christian life that saw theology being taught to those who were even illiterate, and not just taught in an academic, intellectual way of understanding, but a real pragmatic and lived way of understanding. And so that's how, in the midst of those civil wars, there were faithful Christians standing up for the rights of everybody. People concerned with the use of the land. People concerned with how God's creation was being used. Seeing the abundance of creation squandered and swindled away to those who were powerful. And in the midst of that, it was the voices of faithful people from within the church who were speaking out. And so it should come as no surprise that it was people from within the church who started to disappear in the midst of these civil wars. Now, Oscar Romero was a priest of the Roman Catholic Church in El Salvador. He wasn't, as I understand it, a particularly remarkable priest. He was a good and faithful priest. He had come from pretty humble beginnings, very working class peasant family, and he had been educated, gone to seminary, and he became a priest of the church. At the time when he was made a bishop, it's said that He was made a bishop because those in power thought that they would have a pawn that they could easily control to help control some of the influences of liberation theology and these quarrelsome, meddlesome church people and the trouble that they were starting to cause for the governments and the people in positions of power. Again, that idea of perception and interpretation And some people look at Romero and the work that he did, and they say, you know, he was one of the champions of liberation theology, but actually he was not. He came from a part of the church that was understood to be more on the conservative side of things. 
he was not a fan of liberation theology, in fact. He was more interested in orthodoxy, right practice, right belief. And so they thought that it was a safe bet that they would make Romero a bishop, they would have somebody that they could control. However, as his ministry went on and he heard more and more the sufferings of the people, he changed. He was galvanized when his good and close friend, another priest, Rutilio Grande, was assassinated. A priest assassinated. And it didn't stop with Father Grande. Father Grande was just one of many clergy who lost their lives in El Salvador, not to mention in the conflicts in Guatemala, in Nicaragua, in Honduras, and in many other parts of Central and South America. The clergy were seen to be leading the people. And the thought was that if they started to take out the leaders, that the people would lose hope, that they would lose heart, that they would abandon their resistance. But nothing was further from the truth. So after Padre Rutilio Grande's death, then Oscar Romero started to speak out much more strongly. He started to condemn the acts of the military. He was broadcast on radio calling for the military to disobey their commanders, to put down their arms, and to stop the oppression of the people. This is ultimately what got him killed and what made him a martyr. Now he was said, sorry, he said that if he were to be killed, he would not die, that he would rise up in the Salvadoran people, that he would not be going away, that he would come back and continue to lead the people, not he in and of himself, but with God, with the Holy Spirit, with Christ, inspiring people to continue in the work that they had embarked upon. So this evening, I wanted to take part of that story and try to line it up with the gospel reading that we heard from Mark, the story of the Gerasene demoniac. And it becomes sort of a light and dark version of the story. So try and follow with me. So the story of the Gerasene demoniac is this man with a legion of demons that Jesus heals with a word. And people have tried to restrain him with chains and shackles and all kinds of things. And yet he is able to break free of all of them. And yet with a word from Jesus, the demons flee. And the man's mind and spirit and soul are restored. With Romero, Romero hears the cries of the people cries for justice, cries for equality, cries for returning the disappeared. Now, one thing I need to add in is that it became common practice for the militias and the death squads and uh, the people, sometimes the military, and the people in power to organize disappearances of those key people, or at least it started out as key people, that they saw in opposition. And then it became more and more common. People like you and I, normal, average, everyday people, people of little to no importance. And the people in the country were filled with fear because they didn't know if they would be next, if their children would be next, if their siblings would be next, cousins, friends, coworkers, And so as people started to gather, they would read out the names of those who were disappeared. And they said that they were still with them. And that's where the phrase presente, present, here. So they would read out the names of the people, and after their names were read out, then the gathered community would say in a loud voice, presente. 
Romero having heard the cries of the people and praying that God also heard the cries of the people taught the gospel as it had been taught to him. They heard the words of the gospel. They heard the healing words of Jesus and read and heard about the healing actions of Jesus. And so in the midst of what the government and the death squads had to offer, what kind of resistance did they have but to gather and to pray? Now, there were some who took up arms and they joined the guerrilleros, the guerrillas, and they fought. But the majority did not fight. They simply gathered and bore witness, bore witness to the disappeared, bore witness to the oppression that they were experiencing and tried to say that they weren't going to stand for it. And so in the midst of that, Romero, as a leader of the church, simply fulfilled his ministry as a bishop. He led by example. He ministered to the people, listened to the stories of those who had friends and family disappeared. And so when it came to that point when he was martyred, when he was assassinated, the opposite of the Gerasene demoniac, there wasn't a legion that left, but rather Romero joined the Holy Spirit, joined God, joined Jesus, and inspired a legion of people, inspired them to continue with the teachings and the practices that they had been experiencing not to raise up arms, but to bear witness to the atrocities that they had been experiencing, to remember those who had been disappeared, and to speak truth to power, the truth of a different kind of kingdom, not the kind of kingdom that they were living under, but rather God's kingdom, a kingdom where true justice prevails, a kingdom where true equality exists, a kingdom where the abundance of the land is not stolen and squandered, but rather shared so that there is enough for all. And so with the word, life, as opposed to death. Romero was made a saint by the Roman Catholic Church in 2015. The people of El Salvador have been campaigning and petitioning since 1980, since the year that he died, that he should be a saint because of his inspiration, because of his inspirational leadership and his life of example. And so finally, in 2015, the church, after completing its necessary steps, agreed and made him a saint. And so in May of 2015, at a gathering in Rome, it was declared that he was San Romero de las Americas, Saint Romero of the Americas. Acknowledging that inspiration, acknowledging that example of resistance and offering witness and offering a different way to oppose power and to oppose violence not by taking up arms and causing more harm and more death, but one which is perhaps a harder road, but speaking truth to power, proclaiming a different kingdom and a different king than what the world has to offer. This has made people since 1980 and since before extremely uncomfortable because systems of power don't know how to respond. They don't know what to do when you're not playing by their rules. And so the example of Romero continues to unsettle. And so when the liberal side of the church tries to hold on to him as their own, or the conservative side of the church tries to hold on to him as their own, looking a little bit more deeper and underneath the surface does not belong to us. He belongs to God, just as each and every one of us do. 
And so that makes him that much better of an example for us to follow. It's not about politics, because going that road leads one to a place of trying to control, rather than seeking after the kingdom of God, which is not about control and power, but rather about life. And so in our modern day and age, here in 2019, 39 years after his martyrdom, we find that the same issues that were plaguing El Salvador continue to plague our world. So whether it's looking at recent events like in Christchurch, New Zealand, or looking at events closer to home, the example of speaking truth to power and not resorting to violence, but rather a different way, bearing witness, remembering those who are disappeared and who are lost, and making that proclamation that they continue to be with us. It doesn't matter whether it's the victims in Christchurch, victims in Montreal, the victims of human violence anywhere. The gathered community of Christ should be saying presente for each and every name in that tradition that Romero found himself in. An unsettling road and not an easy road. And yet that is the road that Christ himself walked. It's the road that we are all called to follow in well-worn footsteps whether we are are asking Romero to intercede on our behalf in that Catholic tradition of the saints, whether we are seeking to follow in his footsteps or following the footsteps of Christ himself, we are called to that same place. I would ask you to stand for a moment. I would ask you to recall the names of those who have died. Again, whether it's from Christchurch, New Zealand, or any other situation or place that you know of, anywhere, anytime, and recall those names. San Romero de las Américas, presente. Let us pray. May the God of life lead us and guide us in the work of the church. May the Holy Spirit work in and through us. Make us instruments of God's peace and love, speaking truth to power, bearing witness to the life abundant around us and to God's power, not the powers of the world, but your power, O God. Amen. Our offertory.